But I'm also excited. We heard from him already. He is the director of mental health in Los Angeles, Dr. John Sheeran. Um, been a long time advocate for NAMI, not only within Los Angeles, but also statewide, a great partner of NAMI California. Um, I'm gonna read your bio because it's very impressive and I don't wanna leave anything out. So um, in your current role, as the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health Director oversees the largest public mental health system in the United States with a budget approaching $3 billion. But prior to his role at DMH in LA, he served for over a decade at the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, where he held a variety of posts, but most recently the Chief of Mental Health and for the Miami VA healthcare system. Uh, also serves as very, a variety of uh, academic posts, formerly the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science for University of Miami. Also volunteers as a clinical professor for UCLA and USC. In addition to his leadership in health and human service sector, Dr. Sheeran has also made significant contributions to his field in neuroscience, which includes uh, seminal sleep research studies uh, published in science magazines, and conceptual models of psychotic process for which he received prestigious Kempt Award from the American Psychiatric Association. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And we're looking forward to hearing not only what you're doing in LA, but almost how it could potentially um, go throughout the state and how you see uh, all of us working as advocates and making that happen. Welcome, Dr. Sharon. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for letting me get in a quick question there um, before we lost them. Um, and, you know, I, I, first, I, I want to um, pay a debt of gratitude to NAMI um, as an advocacy group. I mean, I, 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 I kind of do this regularly. I think you, in many ways, um, example what, what's possible, what can happen when you have a level of organization around a compelling challenge. And, um, you know, the, the partnership that, that, that we have with NAMI is, is critical. Um, and, and we just need to figure out ways to, 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 to leverage it, you know, more and more. Um, I also, you know, in addition to recognizing Senator Weiner, who really is a courageous guy, um, I, I want to recognize Jim Bell, uh, uh, who, who is moving on because he turned out, but uh, what, what an advocate. And, uh, and I've texted him to tell him that I'm not letting him go. I'm going to keep pestering him. Um, you know, uh, I have, um, I'm trying a new innovative, innovative approach here with um, my image. Can you guys see that? So this is kind of an outline here. Um, and it's very hard. That's, I'm, see, I'm getting better. Uh, to talk, just an outline of kind of the conversation that I'd like to have. Um, and then I have one slide. But I, I thought I would just kind of, you know, do a, a little bit of an uh, overview to get started. I mean, the first thing I just want to talk about is, um, is the fact that the solutions to everything are communities, inclusive communities. Um, I want to talk about the issue of, um, of severe persistent mental illness and homelessness. Um, the idea that homelessness is one thing uh, is a serious, serious problem. We have multiple populations with multiple reasons for becoming homeless. And if we don't look at them, based on uh, you know, why people have become homeless, but also what mo motivates them to not be homeless, then we're, our strategy is totally uninformed. Um, I also wanna talk about those who won't engage. And this really is when we start to get into the, I use the, I use the acronym SPMI, Severe Persistent Mentally Ill, um, because engagement is a, a massive, massive challenge. Um, many people, for a lot of reasons that I'll talk about, don't want to engage. Um, I want to talk about housing solutions. I mean, I, I, did, I did want to throw out the thing about the infrastructure that's going to be liberated. I think that the Senator is probably right. It's, pro it's probably being overplayed, um, but it's got to be something. It's going to be significant. Um, and uh, there are many other issues uh, or opportunities in the housing universe, uh, in my mind, besides permanent supportive housing, which is super expensive, takes a long, long time to build, and some people don't want it. Um, then I want to talk about funding considerations. Um, and uh, so th there's the outline. The first, what the, I want to get started here by talking about community for all. I don't know 
again, this is kind of a new technology. And maybe you guys have seen it a bunch today, but for me, uh, instead of throwing up slides that I share, I got myself some background. Um, and can you read those different, uh, you can. Okay, so really this is the strategic plan for Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health uh, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, in one image. And what you can see is in the green in the center is community. Um, and really what we want is we want people in community because when people are in inclusive communities, the problems, the challenges that we talk about don't really exist. But we know for a fact that people fall out of the community. And when they fall out of the community for a variety of reasons, it's critical that we have guardrails, that we have a safety net that actually helps get them uh, and, and return them to the community rather than having them fall out into what I call the institutions. The institutions are the streets, which is the open air asylum, the jail, which is a closed asylum, or the internal asylum of uh, desperate isolation. Uh, and, you know, I would say, uh, you know, the internal, internal torture of being densely isolated and quite sick. Um, obviously, as you can see, there's an infrastructure item. That's really just about what I need to do, what my department needs to do, what the county needs to do, the state and the Fed to support all of the work. But when we talk about communities, I'm not just talking about treatment. People think, oh, well, it's a mental health department. And what do they do in the community? They provide treatment. Yeah, we provide treatment. Uh, that's an important tool. But we also need to help with what I call the people, place, and purpose. Um, you have to have a kin, if not family. You have to have a support network. People cannot live without a network of support from other people. And that's not, for example, something, and I'll talk about it when I discuss funding, that we're funded for. We're not funded for that. We're funded for delivering service by the minute. Uh, place, people need a place to live, they need a place to be and socialize. Uh, we don't really think about that enough, especially for people who are really, really suffering. What does that mean? How do we deliver it as a part of the community? And then in many ways, one of the more important things, um, access. So when, I, when we use the term prevention, and what are your prevention programs? What I want with prevention programs is access all day long. And what I think, access to me is not having what, you know, the state of California calls adequate doctor appointments. It's actually connecting people with the needs that they have and engaging them and keeping them engaged in their care, in their community. With respect to the guardrails, and the idea here, and the reason I'm going through this is because you have to understand, we have to understand why are people falling out of the community? It's because we don't have these things. And we have to build them to keep the people in the community. And when they fall out of the community, we've got to bring them back. So one of the ways you bring them back is when people have a crisis, you deal with it. You have crisis response systems that are super responsive. And they're not led by law enforcement. They're led by health and human services. They're led by people with mental health expertise. They're, li they're led by people with lived experience. Thank God for Senator Bell and his new bill, which we sponsored. And then that we have crisis receiving and stabilizing facilities. So those are the urgent cares, the crisis, uh, the crisis residential treatment programs, but also the hospital systems. Those are completely inadequate right now. In terms of the, that guardrail, which is yellow, it is Swiss cheese. We, it can't be, or people will continue to leak out because they're so sick and because our communities have not been built into our institutions. And when people fall into our institutions, we got to bring them back. And that is not an easy thing to do. It's super challenging. I know that we're talking about homelessness. The reason I'm giving this intro is to understand the context for the work that we uh, engage every day. And also to recognize that it's for a particular population, which leads me, at least for me, in my role, uh, to my second point here, which is severe persistent mental illness and homelessness. I'm going to say, and I say this based on what I see, what I hear from my team, and also the work that I do. Because, you know, I used to be able to go out once a week. I'm going out about once a month as a psychiatrist to take care of people who are suffering from profound 
chronic mental illness in the street. And I sit on the sidewalk with them when my team tells me they're ready to try to talk to a doctor and I try to engage them. But the thing that we don't understand is that, and we talk about a lot is, oh, well, you know, at least half of the population who's homeless has a serious mental illness. Well, it may be that a significant portion, maybe it's 50% meet criteria for uh, medical necessity so that we could pay for them through a specialty plan. And if I'm using too much technical jargon, stop me. But what I'm saying is, and I'm here, the reason that I'm here is to actually take care of the sickest people, the people who are falling out of community regularly, in and out of the streets, in and out of the jails, and in and out of the hospitals all day long. And until we recognize that, that's gonna, that that is roughly 10% of the homeless population, and we go after that population with the proper tools and dedicated resources and adequate dedicated resources, those people are gonna be languishing in our streets, dying in our streets, and going in and out of jails. And I would say using super expensive hospital resources when we could do much, much better. By the way, since I've been here, which is almost four years, and yes, it feels like 40, because I, I, you know, they're kind of dog years, they're LA County years, 10 per. Um, I'm trying to lighten it up here. Uh, <clears throat> you know, is uh, that, I'm sure I lost my train of thought. What was I just talking about, Jessica? You're talking about the dog ears, and I get that. Um, you were talking about how we can't let them fall out of the crisis system and into the institutions because it's yeah. hard to bring them back. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, the, the, the point is that uh, we, we have to be very complementary in the different efforts. So there are multiple different groups that are trying to address the homeless problem and, and, and and uh, you know, combat homelessness. But unless we're doing it in a complementary and coordinated fashion, we're gonna fail. And I've made a massive effort within my department in my county to say to my department, we're gonna go after the sickest people. We have to do that or else they're never ever gonna get uh, the care that, um, that they need. And that really leads to a, a, a fundamental issue. And it really, Scott Wiener is a major leader. It has to do with what I call the tools of engagement. So when we fail in getting people uh, engaged through our outreach, um, we oftentimes will move on to the next person and that's not acceptable. What, what we have to do for, with people who are refusing care and engagement because of their mental illness or because of their addiction is we have to be able to step up towards more and more compelled uh, models of care. Now, what we've tried to do in LA, in, uh, sorry, in California, and LA County has participated is say, oh, let's redefine grave disability. Let's redefine LPS law. Now, I'm not saying that that's, not, that that's a mistake, and I think there are ways to do it that are, very, that are very fundamental. But what we really need to be thinking about is the tools of engagement. In Europe, they have a thing called shared decision-making. Shared decision-making is really kind of stepping it up above the kind of case management and, and, and you know, care coordination and ACT teams that we, uh, models that we currently uh, deliver. Then there's the issue of advanced directives. You know, giving people the opportunity to create an advanced directive so that when they're not engageable because they've deteriorated, what are, what are the guidelines? What's the algorithm that they will, by law, you know, agree to uh, when they're stable? Then there's, you know, AOT, and AOT is a mixed bag. I think it's fantastic, certainly, in its intention um, and, and, and its, uh, you know, potential use as a tool of engagement, but it's extremely cumbersome to use. Uh, the amount of effort and resource that we have to put into AOT is significant relative to the number of people that we can engage. And I would say that we need to think about that. We need to think about the efficiencies there. And then, of course, there's the temporary conservatorship and there is the full conservatorship. And I would say that temporary conservatorships are significantly underutilized. I would also tell you, and we don't have time for it today, that, that my county with support from the board is going after um, outpatient conservatorships in the street. So we're gonna be going to people who are in the street who we consider to be gravely disabled or gravely disabled adjacent with dedicated resources that we will guarantee uh, including housing or aborting care, including a full-time FSP team, and including uh, access to a, 
a shorter long-term uh, residential bed locked and unlocked. <clears throat> and that when we can't engage them with those resources out front, which we have to be able to deliver, we can't just put people into conservatorships without offering, then we're going to advance, uh, you know, um, legal uh, legal processes to to use what I consider to be the last resort, last ditch effort around engagement, which is uh, conservatorship. Anyway, we've got uh, people who are quite sick. I'm talking about them falling out of community, getting through the crisis system because it's not uh, adequately uh, uh, resourced and consolidated, falling into the institutions. What are the types of housing that uh, are available that need to be available? And I've kind of already tipped my hat to this. Um, permanent supportive housing is a great thing. Um, the fact of the matter is we're 500,000 units of housing short in LA County, 500,000. Um, and if you cost that out at about a half a million per unit, and some would say more, that's a big number. And that's the big number. Uh, the other thing is the time. So we can't think that we're gonna go after the homeless epidemic that exists right now by building out of it. Uh, you know, we have to double down for decades to get enough inventory. Uh, I'm not gonna argue with that, but what do we do in the interim? And I would say, we have to think about existing infrastructure. We have to recognize that the boarding care network, which is dissolving before our eyes, is not just saved, and rescued, but it's expanded and it's improved in terms of the quality of the conditions and the quality of the services. We're trying to do that with many legislators with you. Um, I would say that the infrastructure that will be liberated, and I don't know how much it's going to be, but I can guarantee you when my department has gone from 20% telehealth to 80% telehealth in one month, and we're seeing more people, so we have more encounters, and we have less no-shows, and we have bestimer, better customer service reports from our, from our consumers and from my staff that we're not going to need all of that square footage. And what are we going to do with it? And well, I would say apply it to this crisis. Probably there are many others, but that's certainly one of them. But the other thing that I'll say, and this gets back uh, to, I would, I, would, I would argue, a resource for, for uh, an engagement tool. We have to stop letting people languish in the street and on the sidewalks. And what we can do is we can create what I call pop-up communities. I used to call them interim or intentional short-term communities where people can have uh, you know, access to uh, showers, access to the things that are critical for hygiene, for toileting, uh, access to food, um, access to uh, you know the, the opportunity to live in a safe area, whether it's in a parking lot, whether it's in a park, um, whether it's with tents, whether it's with tiny homes, um, where there are services, services all day long, which right now are being delivered in the street as opposed to in an, or, in an organized type setting. Um, where we can have uh, you know, animals uh, can be, can, you know, uh, for people that have animals, we can take care of them. We can have kennels. We can have child care. We can have benefits and assistance and legal assistance in a consolidated way. We can have recreational opportunities. We can have self-governance if we really do it properly. And people can work. They can cook the food. They can clean their, uh, what I'm going to just call a, a pop-up community. And one of the reasons we have to do that is for the people who are suffering and who are unwilling to say, yeah, sure, I'll take a permanent supportive housing unit, but also because the longer we have people languishing in the trauma of street, the more customers you're generating for me and for my department and for the other departments. We have enough business, trust me. We have to go after that with a different type of model in parallel to the things that exist now and the things that are being developed. In terms of funding considerations, I say this, I've said it to Scott, I say it to Daryl Steinberg, I said it to Tom Insel, I've said it to everybody. We have a system where I had already mentioned, I get, my department gets paid by the minute. We get paid by the minute to deliver a psychiatric service and it's coded in a certain way. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, oh, well, it's 45 minutes of a psychiatrist. Okay, well, fine, then we're gonna give you this much money. 
And then those are attached to programs. And, you know, God bless everyone that's trying to help. And I know the legislators are all trying to help. But what we end up doing is we say, oh, well, let's do this program because this program will help with this thing. Uh, we, 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 we don't think about, and we think about, oh, well, if we just audit things more effectively, um, and if we make sure that our process has, ide has like ideal fidelity, we're going to get the result that we want. What we need, what I need, what my frontline workers need, what all the contractors that work with us need, what all of the communities need, our goals, our outcomes that define and organize all of the work. So we need to sit down and settle on what are those outcomes. And we need to have it be something that the governor is willing to sign off on. And it needs to be driven from the ground up. And it could be things like 10% of kids who are in our college, community colleges, 10% fewer fall out of enrollment per year because of a serious mental illness. We know those numbers, or we can find out those numbers. And then I could be asked, hey, John, that's a big, big prevention initiative. We know that kids in that, that people, human beings in that time frame, are at great risk of developing a psychotic disorder, a profound mood disorder, and falling out. Go after it and decrease it by 10% per year for the next five years. And then let me use the resources. Let me solve the problem. Don't, don't say, oh, well, John, you're going to do that with this prevention program, and you're going to make sure that there's this many psychiatric services that, that, that are being dealt, uh, delivered so that we can pay you this amount of money. That doesn't work. It doesn't, it'll, it, we have a fragmented system that is not incentivized by our full coordinated agenda, which is to find outcomes and go after them. And in the process, innovate, share best practices. And I would say achieve those goals across the different uh, uh, jurisdictions, uh, whether they be frontier and rural to suburban to the, you know, the density of Skid Row. That's the overlay for what I'm going to talk about with the rest of the funding issues. Flexibility, uh, you know, medical necessity. How about human necessity? How about that? Um, 855, God bless Senator Wiener, Steinberg Institute, Patrick Kennedy, who did this at the federal level. LA County was a big supporter. We have to not look at, uh, you know, the Department of Mental Health as the funder of things when we're actually not funded for everything. First of all, the way we get funded is kind of messed up, which I just described. We're also <clears throat> funded to take care of a certain subpopulation who meets certain criteria. Well, there's a lot of people that have what's called mild to moderate mental illness. The funding for them, if they're, uh, if they're Medicaid, Medi-Cal, comes through the managed care plans. <clears throat> so if I have a patient who does really well, and then all of a sudden they no longer meet criteria, I have to dish them off to the managed care plans, which actually don't have the capacity. And then when they have someone who doesn't do well and ends up in a hospital, I'm paying for it, and then I give them back, or I keep them. And that doesn't even have to, that, that doesn't even bring in the uh, private insurers who don't even understand what I'm talking about. I mean, how could they? The system is like really, really complicated unnecessarily. But we have to put all of that funding together. <clears throat> and we have to recognize that the full continuum has to be uh, uh, cared for because there's, there's all, it's all connected and people move up and down it. And it needs to be funded through a network. <clears throat> And that that network doesn't just need to take care of the people with mental illness, but the people with addictions and those with comorbidities who, by the way, are more than uh, anything else present in our streets and in our jails and in and out of our hospitals. And we all know that. <clears throat> and Nami knows that better than anyone because it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's our families, it's your families. On that note, when there's an emergency in the state of California, the mental health responsibility falls on the specialty plans. So if there's an earthquake or there's fires, there's a short period of time during which I'm not caring for the 250,000 members that I care for now through my department, but 10 million. 10 million people, when they don't do well, because it's now connected to COVID, <clears throat> which is going to go on for a long, long time, that trauma and the mental health implications come back to this department. There's no extra funding. 
yeah, oh, when there's a fire, it's like, oh, well, you know, fill out paperwork, this much paperwork to get money from FEMA <clears throat> to uh, pay the people um, who you had to pull from other programs to take care of that trauma. What is that? And then as a last note, I would say that if I'm serving 250,000 people with serious mental illness or severe persistent mental illness in LA County, <clears throat> it should be 500,000. In other words, we are engaging about half of the people we need to be engaging in care. And it's not because uh, we don't want to, um, it's not because I got people that don't care, it's because of the systems and a lot of the things that I'm listing here. <clears throat> Um, did I, yeah, it's all, out of, it's all of this stuff. This, I'm getting the, the, the technology here is a little crazy. I got a couple different screens. And then just as a last point on that, the thing that the state does, and it's not just because of the state and it's not because the state doesn't care. <clears throat> a lot of it comes from the fed is they'll, they'll say to us, do you have an adequate network? What is, you know, and they'll say, well, these are the rules, uh, you know, the, the final rules around network adequacy. You have to have this many psychiatrists, this many psychologists, this many nurses, this many social workers, soon to be this many peers for all the people that you care for. And, you know, LA County generally does pretty well. <clears throat> but what I say to them is, yeah, we do pretty well with the 250. But what about everybody else? What about, um, the 500. So I say, you know, in order for me to be adequate, uh, providing services to the uh, people in LA County or the people in Skid Row, I need about a 400 clinicians to parachute into Skid Row every day. So it's not adequate. And then the other thing, you know, I'm really, I, I, I try to get tricky here. I think I probably didn't even put this, let, let me, I'm just gonna do something so you guys can see what I've been pointing at. You see that? Was that not there the whole time? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's my outline. Um, you know, that, that uh, we, we need <clears throat> to really, really take a step back here, folks. We really, really do. We need to recognize that, we, um, that we're a system that really, in, in many ways, takes care of itself. It's a system that's more focused on checks and balances uh, than it is on delivering uh, services out uh, to the people who need it. Um, and until we do that, uh, you know, and, 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 and one, way to, one, way to, one way to talk about it is uh, relates to um, Charity Navigator. Charity Navigator, when it talks to a nonprofit, will say, you, if you're a direct service provider, you should be delivering 80 cents on the dollar. That's kind of gold standard. Well, what is it in the government? And you know, I joke about this, but it's kind of not a joke. I've worked in the VA. Uh, I worked in the VA for some time, as you pointed out, and I, I actually had the the you know the honor of of getting to know uh, to a greater or lesser degree three secretaries, three cabinet members, and I asked each of them, "What do you think is your uh, you know cents on the dollar?" Because I I honestly think it's about twenty five cents, somewhere between twenty five to fifty cents. And I would say in LA County, which is a progressive county, and this board is doing things, well, they're, they're, they're trying, they're hiring people like me to kind of go after red tape. We're at like 50 cents on the dollar because of so much time dealing with the bureaucratic stuff, with taking care of medical charts and taking care of auditors. Uh, and auditors aren't bad people, they're trying to do their job. But, but why are we setting it up that way when we have so much of a resource shortage. And when we have, we talk about the many, many silver linings of COVID, and I would say this is one of them. We don't have as much resource, guys. We're losing realignment. We're losing MHSA. So we not only need to figure out how to get more money allocated towards the challenge, we have to be more efficient with that resource. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Um, and I'm going to go back to my normal thing because um, I, I think it'll be a little bit less distracting for me and hopefully you hi hello so um do you have some time to take some questions i do awesome well thank you again i love your passion 
Um, I've been in the room with you where, you know, you can tell you care so deeply about this issue and that you want to make real change. And a lot of the things that you mentioned are also for NAMI California, some things we want to focus on is, and especially when it comes to funding at the state level, you know, we want to focus on outcomes and making sure that if we're going to change anything at all, whether it's MHSA or whatever, we first need to know what we're doing right and also where the gaps are. And that can't be measured without any kind of outcome measurable to, to measure against. And so we're 100% with you on that. You know, you have some incredible affiliates within your LA region. I saw Harold is on here from uh, NAMI, NAMI Urban Los Angeles. He's also a NAMI California board member. You also have West Side at Los Angeles. Um, and then you have a, a group of, um, of model Bs, we call them, under greater Los Angeles County. And so you have a great county that has a lot of very active affiliates that are able to provide that peer service. What would you say as um, a mental health director who has that to other mental health directors who might not have as strong family and peer advocates? How do you have them engage the NAMIs within their areas? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I, I, I think in any, any kind of partnership, you really have to find that, uh, you have to find the sweet spot. You gotta find um, the shared agenda. And you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna channel DJ Jaffe, um, who passed away recently. Um, the counties, and, and, and you know, I, I, I don't mean to, to be, uh, to, to discount the people who have been trying to get this work done forever and all of the amazing, uh, fellow directors uh, in, in the different counties who have a lot of challenges. But I'll say in my department, and I think it's true in a lot of other areas, that we really have not been um, laser focused on those people with profound chronic mental illness. And if we're, the whole reason for the carve out, I'm sure if you go back in time, is that. And that's really at some level where NAMI comes in as one of our core partners because the, the NAMI families have been torn apart by profound mental illness. And you have to understand things like what I'm saying, we're the emergency mental health responders to the pandemic, to the fires, to the earth, whatever it is, right? That we've got all these other things that are pulling at us. Meanwhile, there's this separate entity, this separate universe of mild to moderate, which we get pulled into constantly. <clears throat> and then you ask the consumer, <clears throat> the family, the community to be able to decipher that. It's mind numbing and it's why it's such mayhem. So what I would say to, <clears throat> to NAMI, what I would say to my counterparts and I do, let's get back to our, our meat and potatoes and let's work with NAMI <clears throat> and others to, to focus on those with the most profound mental illness. And let's make sure that what we're doing uh, in addition to targeting that um, doesn't leave other people <clears throat> who have needs uh, out to dry but it complements them. I mentioned that in terms of, uh, you know, the housing challenge. Uh, I, I'm saying that I want to go after the 10% relentlessly. I've taken my outreach teams and my homeless, my homeless efforts and the housing that was built in LA County was, I want to say kind of non-specialized. I mean, yes, people who have been housed with uh, MHSA money and more, more recently with No Place Like Home. And by the way, No Place Like Home is money that was dedicated. There was a question earlier for the Senator. Um, it hasn't targeted the most specialized uh, program and, and the people who need it the most. And I think that is, that's the sweet spot. And, and, and we have to go after that as a state. And I think NAMI can be very instructive, like the Treatment Advocacy Center um, and, and I'm certainly trying to drive that uh, in my conversations with my fellow leaders. Wonderful. We have um, a couple of questions on the side here. It says, can you comment on the problem of those with SMI losing their housing, either because when someone is in the hospital or jail for more than 30 days and they lose their SSI or eviction for their behavior? <sighs> yeah, I mean, these are tough things. Uh, you know, the the uh, bureaucratic rules that, that kind of kick people out and pre prevent people from coming in is that's a big part of the problem. Um, and I, I, you know, and, and unfortunately, some of that's self-imposed. I mean, I, I always try to try and find the red tape that's been laid in LA County and go after it. 
Some of it's at the state level, some of it's at the federal level. Um, and, and, you know, those are things that really require concerted um, advocacy efforts. And, you know, NAMI, because as I was saying, uh, you know, has, has set itself up so, so powerfully in, in, in a distributed net network manner can help with that. You know, and I think we, what we have to do there is kind of identify what are the things that are happening um, and reverse engineer to what's causing it and then go after that, you know, whether it's through like le uh, legislation, you know, um, or uh, whether it's regulatory. Um, yeah, and so those, th those, those are those are really um, those are really big challenges uh, for all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then for a recovered consumer, where is the best place for them to provide peer services, rather than participating in being a peer support and our paid position, since most of them live on SSI. Well, I mean, this, this, this is a challenge. I mean, I, I, I would suggest that, um, I, I mean, I don't think these things are exclusive. I don't think it's thoughtful uh, to, to say that they are. Um, you could argue that a part of the recovery journey includes titration down over a, a, a period of time that's individualized for somebody who has the capacity to generate enough income. But really, it should be driven again by the trench. What does that individual need? How much money do they need? How much can they generate? And then, you know, supplement it. Uh, it, it can't be, oh, now you have employment. You can't, you know, you're, you're no longer, you know, meeting, you know, you're no longer disabled. But this is the problem, again, of, of the top-down nature of, frankly, our universe. Um, and that needs to be inverted. That needs to be inverted. You know, our communities, um, our, um, our, our families, our households, our consumers, um, all of the subject matter experts, and I say this all the time to my team, uh, the frontline workers, those are the subject matter experts. I mean, and I say this all the time. I say that I work for my leadership team who works for the middle managers, who works for the supervisors, who works for the frontline, who work for the people that we're serving. And I ask them all the time, what, what do you need from me? You know, throw, a, throw some kind of brick wall in front of me and I'll, I'll try. I mean, I might get banged up. But I'll try because I want to make it easier for you so you can be more successful and serve. But we don't think like that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, you had mentioned when you were talking about the crisis system, you know, the AOT, gravely disabled, advanced directive conservatorship piece. Can you um, elaborate a little bit on this advanced directive? Because I don't think most counties have that. And I do know that a lot of our members would be very interested in what that looks like and how that can help a family member um, when their loved one is in crisis. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't exist in the psychiatry mental health universe and it would require new legislation. And it's something that I think we as directors, as counties through uh, CBHDA and others <clears throat> wanna pursue it. And we would suggest that you join us in that endeavor. Yeah, I that'd mean, be interesting. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit more about like what that would look like? Because yeah. I think that that's something that we would be very interested in. I do know some of our NAMIs like in Butte County and Sacramento County have that as like an offered service, like to help their, you know, loved one. What does this look like? How do you talk to your doctor about it? I know at one time I had it with my family member too, when we talked about like, what would it look like? But it's very, um, again, very medical model, right? For physical. But when it comes to mental health delivery, the families, unless they have some sort of acknowledgement from their, their loved one um, in crisis, even though we need it outside of crisis, right? So like, what would that look like for families? And, and really, how could we become involved and help you guys with that? Well, I mean, the, the, the tools of engagement um, are actually things that require, um, you know, they, they, they require support from the courts. So a, a true advanced directive would be something where an individual, when they were in a relatively stable state, could say, you know, this is the psychiatrist that I want when I'm not doing well. This is the medication that I'm willing to take. I'm not willing to take these. This is the hospital that I want to go to when I'm not doing well. And I will do all of those things when I'm not doing well. And it's determined that I'm not doing well by A and B. And then the courts can say, okay, here, it, it's basically temporary compelled treatment uh, support. 
and and it, and with with you know with and, and look, I'm I'm a I, I believe in civil liberties. This is about humanity here, uh, you know. And we can talk about grave disability, which I think is a is a, is kind of a misnomer, um, and and involuntary treatment and conservatorship, if you want. But <clears throat> the idea is. That you know, when when uh, when when someone's illness is uh, is actually threatening their ability to live safely in the community, and then at times others in the community, uh, in a chronic fashion, we have a humanitarian responsibility to provide them the opportunity, you know, um, tools to uh, to recover, and, and we 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 don't we don't do that. So those things, if you can imagine your loved one who signed off on those things when they were kind of let's say on medications and it's not all about medications, but that they were stable. And then you, and then your treatment team had the authority um, to put those in place when it was determined by experts that, that it was, that the person, that this individual is not stable. And that information is given to the court. And then the court come back and says, Hey, you got two weeks or you got a week, you got a month with these things that have been agreed to, to help the person come back and stabilize. And that'll be, you know, uh, that, that'll help them work, uh, you know, in, in this episode, uh, back to recovery. Yeah, I love that idea. Just, and, and you're the first person that I've heard mention it in the kind of um, menu of all of the crisis services that we already know out there. Um, and I think that that would be really helpful for our loved ones. Um, the other thing is, is that I talked about the invisible population with Senator Weiner about like, when we're talking about this invisible population of people who are living with SMI with their families, it's it's this invisible population that doesn't, you know, we're not, they're not on the streets. They're maybe not the most um, present, but our families are caring for them, making sure that they're, they're taken care of and have a house over their head. But the worry is, is that as that population kind of is on that verge of becoming homeless when their loved ones can no longer care for them, what is available? Have you guys thought about that? I know you've been doing a lot of work on board and care in your area. And so I'm just wondering if that's something that you're thinking about as well when you're having these discussions. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 have, to, we, we have to figure out the resource arrays that are gonna keep people in the community. Um, and not let people, you know, get too far, get into the kind of institutions, um, whatever that means. I mean, and, and one, you know, one of the things um, I, I had mentioned them before, I mean, I think the thing that keeps people in communities is obviously treatment, but it's people, place, and purpose. Uh, and um, I have talked to the local Tanami um, GLA, um, and there's many chapters, and they're, they're actually forming some really nice kind of coalitions about um, what to do when someone is not well and is kind of maybe um, no longer manageable in a home with a family. Um, well, you know, in those scenarios, uh, is there a way for us to, rather than invest in a boarding care bed, you know, and ultimately a hospital bed, uh, or, uh, you know, <laughs> have to go into the streets and, 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 you know, when someone's languished and gotten so far down the road or even jail, God forbid, is there a way for us to do stuff to support that home in mitigating uh, further deterioration. Uh, we haven't come up with anything that real concrete or fundable, but that would be something that I think is an important step for the field. And it's something where NAMI is, is you know, more equipped than anybody to help us around. Yeah. Um, and, and at the end of the day, no matter what we do, it has to resonate with the people we're doing it for. It has to. You know, and I mean, I, I, I mentioned something in passing um, earlier about access. I mean, access, you know, it's not network adequacy. It, it's so much more, you know, and it's Indigenous Peoples Day. You know, yesterday was, uh, was, was coming out day. Uh, we have to recognize that, that you know, um, that the disparities that we see, there's many explanations for, but one of them is access. And access is knowledge about what's actually out there, recognition that something's wrong, um, uh, help navigating these systems, which are super complicated. They're a maze. Getting to the resource and being able to actually drink from the trough of resource, uh, which, uh, which is a problem. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every clinic that in, in, in LA is like the most inviting place. It's not. 
you know, and then insisting that when someone gets to that resource that the door is open. And frankly, if the door is not open, I used to say this a lot in the VA, we need to kick the door down. That's the only way that we're going to move this system. Well, we're, we're out of time and I'm so appreciative. Of, again, your passion, it is motivating. It's definitely something that I can tell you're, you're trying to break down those walls for individuals and families. And I appreciate your work you do in LA. And I know that you are a statewide leader as well. And so we really appreciate your partnership at the state and what you're doing um, as we stand side by side to make sure that families and individuals are getting the care that they they need where they need it and when they need it because like you said it's a spectrum right you don't, you're not just in one spot, part of it it's up and down and we we move with it so thank you so much for your innovation and your leadership oh it's a real honor to be with you thank you all very much for listening well we had a great morning and we thank everybody who participated not only in our opening session but also this advocacy session if you missed, if you said, oh no, I gotta choose advocacy versus family or criminal justice section, um, it's okay. Everything is recorded and on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch all of the different workshops if you've missed some. Um, we're gonna have a quick break, uh, but please just get some lunch and, and rejuvenate and energize yourself and then join us again for our afternoon workshop session. So. Thank you all for everything, for participating and for being with us. And again, thanks to all of your leadership, every single one of you who is on this um, workshop plenary today, because of you, the work you do within your family, within yourself and in your community that we're able to continue to break down these walls. So thank you all. <laughs>